Thank you for joining us for another very special interview episode of the Clive Barker podcast. In episode 383, Jose and Ryan are joined by Hans Rufert. He is most widely known for his culinary work with the Next Food Network star and his work with the Gastric Cancer Center. And of course, Barker fans will be excited while we geek out with him about Imagica. Hans created the Imagica trading card game as well as the appendix at the end of the later editions of the novel. When we say his knowledge is encyclopedic, that's no exaggeration. Uh, this episode is available on both audio and video, and there are a couple of places in here where we reference something visual, so if you want to see that, uh, check out the YouTube version. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Over 50% of the proceeds go to the Texas Children's Cancer Center, where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Uh, well, welcome uh, to the Clive Barker podcast uh, today. Um, well, good good uh, afternoon, Jose, or evening. Good evening. Hi, Ryan. It's 8 <laughs> o'clock hey. here. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. had dinner. Yeah, and uh, we have a special guest today, um, Hans Rufert who um, Clive Barker fans will recognize the name uh, from the appendix in, in, the, in some editions of Imagica and mm -hmm. also from the Imagica card, trading card game. Uh, so, and you're famous for a lot of other reasons too. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that as well. Um, but of course. Welcome, Hans. Thanks for having me guys. I appreciate it. This, this is a long time coming and we tried to do this a while back and, uh, yeah. life sort of got in all of our way. So I'm glad we finally got this uh, scheduled and here we all are on our different coasts. Um, you yeah. you're in Alaska, we're on the East coast. Um, I'm in Atlanta and it's, I'm in uh, Cleveland. yeah, Cleveland. So, uh, is it is it chilly in Alaska? This is probably a redundant question. Pretty cold up that uh, way. Yeah, it's it's about like ten degrees right now. No, thank you. No, thank you. I'm. <laughs> uh, it it got down to twenty seven the other day, and I thought I was uh, a popsicle. So uh, yeah. Oh yeah, they wheelchaired me into the car when I was leaving today, and the nurse was like talking to my wife through, past me and leaving the door open, and all of a sudden I started shivering, and she goes, "Oh my goodness, I shouldn't be." standing here with the door open so she closed the door everything go well with uh with your procedure today i don't want to overshare but uh you mentioned being <laughs> in a wheelchair so all yeah, good yeah no it, it was an endoscopy it, it went fine actually it was it all the whole thing only took like an hour i mean it was more waiting than anything yeah and you got a good nap out of the whole thing yeah yeah i sure did you get, after and a certain you, age you got to start checking these things uh oh, yeah yeah yeah, oh, and I'm no not... stranger to endoscopies. I think I've had about 40 so far since uh, wow, since 2005. Gosh, yeah. So if they would give me my own endoscopy, if I could do like a periscope, like a home do, you know, DIY oh, endoscopy, I think I could oh, do no. it. <laughs> oh. I mean, you've been 17 years cancer free by now, right? That's uh, knock on wood. Yeah, that's um, that's a big um, that's a big step. Yeah, I'm for those who don't know, I'm a stomach cancer survivor. Um, and in 2005, I lost originally half of my stomach and half of my esophagus. And then in gosh, 2000, I think 12, they had to go in and remove all of my stomach and all of my esophagus and one part of my collarbone, two ribs. I think they gave me a hysterectomy. Um, so they, uh, <laughs> they've done quite, uh, quite a number on me. Uh, I think I've had oh now in 17 years, I've had 15 surgeries. Um, oh. so yeah, I'm no stranger to the hospital, but, uh, and, and, Getting back to the Clive point, he was with me um, all the way and was such a good friend. In fact, in 2007, when I was in the hospital, Clive sent me my first iPhone because he was so desperate for me to be able to send him pictures and videos and whatnot. And I had a crappy phone at the time, and he sent me an iPhone, um, oh, wow. well, which really even cool. further endeared me to Clive because I was coveting an iPhone from the hospital. Like, damn it, I need one of those. But anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's so cool. Uh, how did you guys uh, meet? That's a, I think that's kind of a fun fun story. Um, he was a guest at the World Horror Convention back in, gosh, 1994, 95 in Atlanta. 
Right. And I had a crazy aunt. Oh, she was actually my great aunt, Joe. Josefina was her name. And um, so she was such a sweet lady, but she was kind of insane. She was from a little tiny North Georgia town called Cannon, very country. And she was a voracious reader. She read two or three books a day. I mean, really just like not speed reader, but she just just devoured books. And she was a huge Clyde Barker fan. And she uh, gave me Weave World. It was my first Clyde Barker book, and it was her dog-eared copy of it. Um, but she was just a – she wanted to meet Clive for whatever reason. And she'd never met any authors. She loved Stephen King, and she loved – uh, she loved Clive and wanted to meet him and knew that he was coming to Atlanta. Well, she went in for a routine heart procedure, had to have a stent put in, and sadly she passed away on the on during that what should have been a routine procedure. And I had no intention of necessarily going to meet Clive, but um, my aunt Jo was so you know adamant that she wanted to go and meet him that I thought you know for what it's worth, this seems like a silly fanboy thing, but I I wanted to go and just shake his hand and say listen you meant the world to this little old lady from from east nowhere georgia and where i'm from we're famous for marble in fact the uh we mine uh white marble and the sort of gray and white marble and also pink marble the uh, all the marble in dc uh much of it was mined in, in my hometown the, the lincoln monument was mined five miles from where i live Wow. And so there was an old guy that made these sort of desk plaques. And so the, uh, I had for Clive made this, uh, this plaque that says Clive Barker. I'm not a plaque. It's like a desk thing, you know. And uh, again, I felt like such a weird, goofy fanboy because I, I was there sort of in, on behalf of my Aunt Jo. Uh, and so I went to the Horcon. I met him. I gave him that thing. And his grandfather, or maybe it was great grandfather, was a um, a sculptor of marble and made headstones and things just like that oh. in the UK. So we, you know, he just loved it. I told him about Aunt Joe. He he was moved to tears. I had chill bumps. Was moved to tears, and we just connected in that moment. And so that entire weekend, um, there was nobody traveling with him at, in Atlanta. So I kind of became his, you know, unofficial tour guide. I went to all the panels and we just we just hung out the entire weekend. We just made a connection. Uh, we exchanged oh, wow. numbers and I you know, I just felt like this would be weird for me to call this number, but he ended up calling me because he knew uh, I was a fan of uh, at that time where I played Magic the Gathering, I played another card right. game called Blood Wars and he was interested in making a card game. So he reached out to me saying, "Look, I've interviewed Wizards of the Coast, I've interviewed TSR at the time it was a separate company." Um, I've interviewed, um, there was another one based in Atlanta here that made, um, it was a werewolf game. I can't, why am I, I'm dr drawing a blank right now. Oh, uh, but anyway, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cult, anyway, cult with a K maybe, no, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. um, there were several kind of those, all those things were sort of happening at the same time. So he reached out to me and he said, Hey, would you mind being a consultant on this? And I said, you know, Actually, I was already kind of daydreaming. My my best friend Sean Curran and I had been playing Blood Wars, and the whole time I was thinking, you know, this is an okay game, but we could do so much better. He was a mathematician. We were lifelong gamers. We were the kind of kids who would hide in the high school library during pep rallies, um, you know, ahead of football games. We would be playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you know, or whatever stupid game in the in the high school library. So we were, you know, of that gamey kind of nerdy culture. And so I told Clive, I said, look, not only do I think we could help make you a game, I think you already have a game in the Book of Magicka because it's it's built for that. You've got five dominions. You have warring factions. You've got, you know, you're all – the whole book reads out – plays like a game. I mean it, it reads like a game. That There's a – there's a um, – all of the mechanics that you would need are already there. And he was like, I never thought of it like that. So it, it just became like as fast as we could handle this this idea – so before I knew it, Sean and I, um, again, this would have been in 95, I think, um, HarperCollins put us on a plane, flew us to New York. Uh, we, we went and bought briefcases because we thought if you went to a meeting in New York, you had to have a briefcase. You know, they were empty other than like, you know, a, a pen and a pad of paper. But we are selling it. Yeah, oh, we were. And, and <laughs> what was wild is we met with at that time, HarperCollins had a division called Harper Prism. And uh, um, John Silbersack and John Douglas were Clive's immediate editors. And um, we went to this meeting, and 
they said, look, we are looking for a company that can do this turnkey. We want somebody who can not only do the game mechanics, they can uh, be the art, do the art direction, you know, do the contracts for all the art, do the layout, do the whole deal. Can you guys do that? And I just said, absolutely, we can do that. Now, meanwhile, Sean is literally kicking me under the table like, what the hell? We can't do all that. So I, uh, I don't know where the bravado came from, but well, Clive had given me a pep talk ahead of the meeting saying, I want you guys to do this thing. You've got the passion. You've got the knowledge. Just say yes to everything. And he said, you know, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody that's going to take this, uh, this idea or this challenge and just make it a reality. So we said yes. And uh, to make a very long story short, we ended up um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, commissioning over 300 pieces of original art from all sorts of amazing artists, many of whom I'm still fantastic friends with. Uh, of course, Clive himself did uh, did some a few pieces of art for the uh, for the game, and we we had a group of playtesters all over the country, actually uh, overseas as well. We did this uh, this project, and uh, we did I did I sat there and did all the layout of every single card. We ended up having to create icons, and you know again to write the whole rule book, uh, design the packaging. I think it was a phenomenal project. I, I'm still just crazy proud of that uh, of that entire experience. That's amazing. That's that's such a great story. Uh, Ryan has the entire uh, card collection for the nice. Magic card game. Yes, <laughs> yeah. not easy to yeah, not easy to do. That's a that's no, a tough collection. It took me years, and actually, uh, Mark Miller ended up helping me out with it uh, by the end. By Mark, training. which Mark yeah. Miller? Now, Mark Miller, because there were two Mark Millers involved. You're talking about uh, Clive's. Uh, yeah, you used the, to work yeah, with Clive at, at Seraphim. Yep, I because there was him. there was a uh, there was a Mark Miller actually that worked at Harper Collins at the time too, oh. who was kind of one of our liaison. Different Mark Miller. It's funny that oh, okay. there there were two in the equation, but yeah. Um, okay. Well, and and some of those cards, um, the the promo card, I think it's Emsfet Esau. Um, yeah. was supposed to go out in Inquest magazine, and somehow it kind of got screwed up, and it went out in a few of them, but not all of them, and a lot of them got destroyed, and so it became, oh, it yeah. went from being not only a rare card, it became like a hyper rare card because a lot of them oh. accidentally got uh, got shredded. So there's and there's a couple like Mario's Costa Rica, is yep. one that's super rare. It's yep. like 50, 100 bucks if you find it on. eBay. Oh wow, I should uh, I should look and see if I have any extra ones. I might make a little money on the side selling some oh, promo yeah. cards. Uh, I do one. have, uh, and I mentioned this uh, to you, Ryan. I do have somewhere, and I have to find them. Um, I mean, I know where they are. I just got to dig them out. There were some uncut sheets, and they called them signatures. So a, a signature would have, and I have to look again how many cards were on there. That's how they collated them, and they're beautiful to see these uncut sheets. And if I'm not mistaken, there were seven of them. Uh, and of course, they were the common ones. They were the ones. There were a few cards that were included in all of the starter decks, and then of course the uncommon. And then there were two different signatures for the rares. And on one of the signatures, Piopa exists only once. So, like, there were 50 cards on the top of the oh. signature and then 50 cards on the bottom. And there were blank cards where they would do Piopa was the ultra rare. And then there was a blank. And what was cool about the blank, those were meant to have been pulled out and destroyed. But they weren't destroyed. So, occasionally, you'll find a card that has the logo on the back and that's blank on the front. Oh. And so I actually have, and I'll, gosh, I, I should have grabbed it beforehand. Um, I have a few of those that I then ask some of the artists to do some little fun sketches on. So I've got one that Clive did a, 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 a you know, a, a, a one of a kind kind of a sketch on the front of and a few of the other artists. So um, I thought that was kind of cool that there were some blank cards in there. Kind of a, kind of a wild card. Uh, yeah, so, that's, that's, that's really amazing stuff. What were you going to say, Brian? Uh, so which came first? Was it the, the Imagica appendix that you made or, or the card game? No, or it was, was, it, kind of or was it of part other? of the study no, it's, of, yeah. That's a great question. So um, the card game came out in 97 and, and to, to really come up with that. And then what was supposed to be the next expansion, which was the Inovo expansion, which Harper Prism, that division kind of overextended themselves and Harper ended up shutting that down, which sadly meant that the, um, that the expansion never happened. But I had all of these notes. I mean, I had crazy amounts. of. I, I went through the book seven times um, just for that, just for the card game. And really anything that was said, I tried to make a note of it. And especially if it was said twice, you know, so I sort of had, I had the sort of ranking system and my brain was very encyclopedic. I tend to remember these details. Um, I mean, even, even now, 
I, I think about, you know, things in, in the different uh, Kesperits and around his order X. I mean, like oh, I remember yeah. all of that stuff. So um, the game came out in 97 and, you know, it was pretty much it had by, by end of 99, it was sort of, you know, it was not much going on there. Uh, and hey, remind me about the the cover that you're holding up there. So yeah. we uh, when the um, Clive then called my wife was pregnant with my first child. Our first child was born in 2000. Uh, he called me in 99, just sort of out of the blue and said, hey, listen, we're getting ready to reprint Magica. I love the artwork that Richard Kirk did. And we'll talk about Richard Kirk a little more. He did 16 of the images in the uh, in the card yeah. game and just a just a great, great friend. And um, it's funny, we're all 10 years apart. I just turned 50, Richard Kirk just turned 60, Clive just turned 70. So we're all um, oh, 10 years apart. So. 10 years apart, yeah. Yeah. So, and actually uh, Clive and Richard Kirk uh, share the same birthday. So, um, but again, 10 years apart. Um, so he said, I would love for Richard Kirk to do some illustrations and for you to take all of the notes that you did for the card game and turn it into appendix. So the game came first, the appendix came second. Uh -huh. So we had a great time working on that. Um, Richard Kirk has a very, very detailed style of illustration, but yeah. for this, they, he did a little more, um, a little more pen and ink, a little, you know, he does this very fine pointillism style, um, style of work yeah but for that and actually hey the images just are showing up on the right hand side there's two guys in the background so on my right i guess it's your left yeah uh, for venef no venef and in venef yeah. there's two guys in the back that's actually me and richard kirk uh he put oh, us no in kidding. the oh, yeah that's, and and actually apparently on the on the image of his order rex we're on the bridge although it's so tiny i don't know which ones we are but on that you can definitely see the two guys are you um, the one holding the mantis no, this is in the background of that. If you look oh, in the in the, very, background. in the background, there's two oh. guys, uh, kind of looking wearing glasses. Oh, yeah, there you are. That's, oh, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. So, uh, and I don't know who can right. see you or what we're hearing, but there's a guy with an oval-shaped head as me, and the other guy is Richard Kirk. Yeah, um, I can definitely tell. That. Yeah, I don't know so why. That's... I'm sorry for asking if you were the guy holding the mantis. That oh, that's fine. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, we're all a little weird looking, but I, I thought that was funny. Put Easter eggs in there, but so yeah, uh, that came out in '99. Now, when you held up that cover, and again, I don't know if anybody is looking at this, but the cover of the book, Richard Kirk actually did an illustration that was a full wrap around for that edition. And what that's not the that's not the one. That cover no. was supposed to be for Galilee. So oh, that, um, makes more that, was, sense. that was a prototype cover um, with the, the guy with the boat, because that scene makes no sense right. for the story of a Magica. So not. when it came out, Clive was pissed. I was pissed. Of course, Richard Kirk had gotten paid. I mean, he was pissed that it didn't got, you know, that it, they didn't use this beautiful wraparound cover, which I believe he eventually gifted to Clive. Um, but they yes, did, uh, they did do a, a separate cover for the two volume edition. One of them has like uh, a mountainous area and then the yeah. city of uh, and I'm not sure who did order X. I'm not yeah. sure it was his order X, but I don't know who did yeah, but that. That's cover. not that's no. not Richard Kirk. So. In fact, that combined edition that you were holding up there um, was done after the split two volume. The the split right. two volume edition was released about the same time that the game was what came out. And that was really an unfortunate thing, you know, because most people would buy volume one and then sadly the where they split that book was done not based on where it ended in the story like it wasn't they didn't pick a great transition point they went no. they just tried to divide the number of pages roughly in half so if you were to only read the first book it stops right before things really get exciting in magic right 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 before you know this yes they they dip their foot into the other dominions but right when things really start rolling mm -hmm. happens about 100 pages in the second book so so many people have told me that well i read the first book and i just it didn't grab me but yeah. the book was never intended to be divided in two they did that strictly for um and i feel like i'm i'm speaking badly of uh, of the guys at harper collins but that decision was made based on pure numbers and the size of the paperback uh and logistics nothing to do with where it should have been divided so uh, in, I mean, being a, somewhat of an Imagica guy, um, I know way too much of that history, but they decided to split it into two books. I think it was a, it was a poor decision for, for it, the story. It so really bothered me because at the time I, I, when I was, look, I was walking through a bookstore and like, oh my God, there's an Imagica 2. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly right. And, and you're yeah. not the only person to think that. Several people yeah. said, oh, I didn't know there was a sequel. And then yeah. they would pick it up and go, this is this is very familiar. So, yeah, that was a that was just a yeah. bad business decision. And, you know, Clive and I have had many conversations about it. We sh- wish we could undo that. Uh, you know, again, I did. I was a we were a separate company from HarperCollins, but I worked closely with some of those guys. And that's one of those like, hey, somebody ask, you know, ask somebody who's read the book, like who actually knows the story before yeah. you go and break it into two books. So Yeah. Now that you mentioned it, that it was supposed to be a Galilee, that makes a lot more sense because you see the boat and yep. it, you know, the when the guy goes off into the sea and all that stuff, this, this would be uh, much more appropriate for that. Yes. Um, totally wrong cover. Yeah. Could you describe what Richard Kirk's cover looked like? I'll ask him, uh, and if you guys haven't had him on the show, you really should, because he's an amazing, uh, just an amazing guy in in general. He did a uh, he did one of the albums for the band Corn a few years uh-huh. ago, and he's done a whole bunch of work with uh, Kaylin Kiernan and uh, China Melville. Um, so anyway, just a, he's an awesome. Oh, we definitely you, you should talk him. to him. We're working yeah. on that. So well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll grease the wheels on that. He, <laughs> okay. he can be a little shy. So I'll, uh, I'll put okay. in a good word for you. It, it, um, it was sim- similar to your situation. It just, you know, we've been talking to him about it for a couple of years and it yeah. just hadn't, hadn't come, come together but, yet. Uh, one of yeah, the things I told, yeah, I mean, just to answer your question, I he, you know his stuff is so lush, and every time you look at a Richard Kirk piece, you see something mm-hmm. new, and it yeah. ex- was exactly that. It was just this beautiful landscape of so many of the sort of iconic things from Imagica in this very lush, organic. Um, I just his stuff is so visceral, and when you when you look at it, when you yeah. when you dive into it, I don't want to say surreal because you know there's. But there are there's these organic things like wasps that morph into uh, into beetles that morph into these you know ferns and I mean it's just there's always something going on in his yeah. Ari that's a beautiful uh, piece that you're holding up there yeah this is the in ovo so yeah. th- th- it doesn't get more organic than this one yeah it's uh, beautiful stuff sure so. So the original cover ended up being gifted to Clive by Richard Kirk. That's what yeah, and I don't I don't have a uh, an image, but of uh, but I'm sure we can find it. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. So actually, um, I want one thing I wanted to say really quick is that um, we've started a Dungeons and Dragons game that we do online through our podcast, and uh, and it's set in the Second Dominion, and that's why I've commissioned these these maps. Uh, and your appendix was. I mean, was critical. I wouldn't have been able to get anything done nice. without that stuff. Yeah, I mean, being able to visualize, and I made up my own, you know, terrible looking map to give to the artist to say like, hey, this is kind of what I had in mind. And I found an artist that had read the book too. So, and then we kind of went back and forth a whole bunch. And actually, if you don't mind, I think I'll share the Isorder X one first, and then we'll yes, let's the, do that. Then we'll look at the. Um, so here's Isorder X. So this is since it's our game is in present day. So this is these order X now versus what it would have been, you know, at the end of Imagica. So nice. A few, a few I love that. Yeah, I see the the the, the per, pyramid shape with a hill with a big palace on the top of the hill. So that looks just like the book describes. And you have all the Casperids there, and the Eretic Casperid. Look at that. The pivots. And, and the, the pivot I remember ruins. The, the yeah. map maker was like. Why does the river come from the top of the mountain and work its way down? That doesn't uh-huh. make any sense. So that's, that's right. In the, it's in the book. You got to do it. Yep. <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense. It's magical. In yep. fact, that's that image uh, that Richard Kirk did was the first one he turned in. It's called Rivers in Reverse. And oh, um, yeah. and at some point, you'll have to uh, pull that image up or look at it on the in the cards. And you've got them all, Ryan. Uh, so yeah. it's kind of an orangish colored thing and it shows, you know, I guess it's Judith because it's a female that's walking mm-hmm. through the rivers. I have to quit tell a quick story in that when I was looking for artists and this is, you know, 95, the Internet was not quite what it is now. Right. So I was actually mm-hmm. putting calls for artists out on sort of message groups like bulletin boards were still a thing. And um, Richard Kirk was one of the first to respond. And when he sent his, he said, I'm, I, I work in a library in London, Ontario. I'm not a professional artist, but I, you know, I love it. And I love Clive Barker and I love Imagica. And the first image he sent me was of a coelacanth. Now, a coelacanth is a fish that uh, they thought was extinct. They'd only seen it in fossil records. Uh, and oh, then yeah. in 19, uh, I think 1938, someone caught one off the coast of the Comoros Islands off of, um, you know, kind of near uh, Madagascar. So I that's 
I have a tattoo now that Richard Kirk that made for me on my on the oh. back between my shoulders of the coelacanth. So for me, um, it kind of signifies me surviving my cancer journey. It um, it's the I think of it as the survivor fish, but because we we connected over our love of the coelacanth, because that was one of the first images he had sent me was a coelacanth. In that image of rivers in reverse, there's a coelacanth tail uh, kind of on the bottom right or bottom left. I don't have it in front of me. Um, that was sort of a nod to that's how I found Richard Kirk was through our love of the coelacanth. Um, oh, that's cool. That's the so fish anyway, with the the, bony head, right? Yep, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. And it yeah, kind of yeah. has this sort of three lobed tail. Um, mm. And it's it's one of the primitive lungfish that can breathe a little bit of atmospheric air, even though it's, it's at the very bottom of the ocean. Uh, but anyway, so uh, yes, the whole idea of the rivers in reverse, uh, that's, that's, there was a reason that I gave that to Richard Kirk, and I love that he's a big fan of putting Easter eggs in images, so to have that little silicon tail in the bottom oh, of the cool. image was very intentional. Now, you said there's another map. I want to see that as well. Is yeah. that, or is that? Yeah, we have a I'll map of the here. Dominions. Which is, you know, that was what Gentle was trying to do throughout the book. He had this idea that he wanted to, um, he wanted to make a map. Uh, you know, it's, but yeah, look at that. There's the Inovo, Mount of the Babayak, Sucking the Rock, goes back to the fifth, Patashokwa, Venev. The Mike. rest of it is not uh, commissioned yet, right? So we just have. No, uh, Jose, you yeah. keep saying that. That's This is it. <laughs> it's this finished. This is it. Right, yeah. right. It is finished. We, yeah, yeah cause be, you're exactly. Because the first, I mean, what would you do in the first, right? I mean, yeah, because right. it was. Be just I mean, an ocean. I, well, I mean, it. Although, you know, when when Gentle first crosses from the dearth into, you know, across the erasure into the first, it's one giant city, right? And it's just yeah. it's just endless, limitless, you know, and it, which obviously was the city of God. But then afterwards, yes, of course, it becomes this this ocean. Not spoiler alert. Sorry, if you haven't read a Magica, you're, you're going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> And if you have a right of magic at some point, you're going, why do they remember all this stuff? Which is what my wife says. It's like, well, how can you remember all this stuff? Well, there's oh, a, a quick reply to that is just at the opening of the book where it says Hans Ruford has lived and breathed the air of the Imagica. Right there. No, and I, 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 I'm not kidding, guys. I'm really not kidding. I have dreamt. Um, and is that is that past tense for dream? I don't yes. know. Dream, yeah. dreamt. Mm -hmm. uh, I have so many times, you know, recently even, in Imagica, like I'm, that's a part of the landscape of like when when I go places, and I don't I don't mean to sound like waxing poetic or whatever. Truly, I spent so much time researching this that I I feel like it's um, you know, I, this is a dumb example, but there my my grandmother used to work at a mall in Atlanta that uh, has changed a million times. But I sometimes in my dream I I remember how that mall used to be laid out, where the arcade was and where the food court was. It's just one of those places that's familiar to me. I spent tons of times uh, there, you know, when, when I was a kid. And just like that, I have these just very strong ingrained, almost in my DNA, uh, dreams in the Imagica. And, and it's, it's beautiful. It's sad at times because, like, when I wake up, I'm, I kind of miss it in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it, uh, that to me is speaks to Imagica and what an amazing mythology it is. It's not I just know. a story. It is a mythology. And I feel like, um, there's a lot more that could be done there, especially in this age of Game of Thrones and the house of dragon. And, um, you know, even the new Sandman series, the technology exists and, I don't want to give too much away, but there is a conversation happening about how do we take this mythology and how do we present it to one of these streaming services? Because it's too big for a movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, but even even if it was animated, um, I mean, there could be, you know, easily a five or six season series of, of one of these sure. serial type streaming things um and so that's a conversation that clive and i honestly we've had for a few years now but we're ramping up that conversation and again nothing concrete but i'm stupid excited uh, about the idea of being able to play in this in this uh, oh these worlds yeah that would be amazing that would be That'd so be tremendous yeah there's Actually, been I, so many uh, conversation about you know a show with weave world or a show for right. uh yeah. the, you know a cartoon for the thief of always or a oh, show yeah. for you know, great and secret show, the great and secret show, and it's like Magica is. It's it's so great to hear you mention all that stuff and and 
places and talking about your dreams of this place, because I feel the same way about this book. I mean, this book was the one book that really kind of crystallized uh, my love of fantasy. And uh, it's I have it in so many different editions. I mean, oh, me too. Yeah. Did, did you get to see the one that came out? I think it was a couple of years ago. It was a Sunspot Publications. Yeah, yeah. I got one. They, they, yeah. Yeah, they actually sent me Sun one. Top. Yeah. Sun Tub. Yeah, Sun, Sun Tub. Tub. They ask, uh, they'd ask both Richard Kirk and I permission to reprint uh, because even though um, HarperCollins had hired us to do that, we sort of own the – we own them. You know what I mean? That's our right. intellectual property, whatever. So um, they asked if they could reprint it, and we were honored that they did, and so they, they sent us each of one of the fancy editions or whatever. So, yeah, I'm proud to have that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's that, that was a, a very impressive edition. Uh, and I think it totally deserves because this book is just a beautiful book. And one of Clive's quickest books. And uh, amazingly enough, it's the longest one that he ever wrote. Um, and, and the other thing, too, it, you know, it's always to me, it's kind of sad when people say, oh, Clive Barker, the Hellraiser guy or the Candyman yeah. guy. And those are yeah. fantastic. I mean, I'm not knocking them at all, but those are more like popcorn in that. And he he said the same thing in interviews that you know it's those of course are the things that were iconic, but those aren't the things that he's necessarily the most proud of, right? And so yeah. uh, they also kind of pigeonholed him a little bit into being the horror guy. But sure. when you read a book like Great and Secret Show or um, you know uh, The Thief of Always or of course the Magica, this is so much more going on with Clyde Barker. I mean, he's uh, if you've spent much time around him, and I. Uh, for for a time there, we were doing my wife and I were doing all of his art prints, and uh, so I would go to his house two or three times a year and stay for a few days. And the man just vibrates with energy, and and uh, I don't mean in a metaphysical way. He's like literally he's he's trying to squeeze so much into every day because he has so much that he has to get out of his head. Yeah, uh, it's inspiring. It's hard to be around him and not be inspired by just the the absolute abundance of creativity that this man you know exudes it's crazy it's, uh, and i think it's, it's just amazing. a wonderful thing and and but to speak to what you'd said earlier yes we need to have a movie for the thief of always what an amazing uh you know book uh, you know any whatever format whether it's live action or animated or stop motion it would be amazing um i i think it's a shame uh, that we haven't that we haven't done that to this point, but at the same time, now again, that we have the, these formats of these long uh, episodic where you can do 10 or 12 episodes, maybe it's better that it's uh, that it's taken a long time for those things, because I, I think those will do uh, true yeah. justice to these. I mean, they, they, nothing could ever capture them like the book could, but um, rather than a two hour movie or an hour and 45 it, movie, yeah, it, needs it, it, 12 hours. it needs nuance, right? It yeah. needs detail. It needs world building. And you can't just slam that into uh, one movie or two movies or even three you movies. even introduce all the characters in one movie. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, mean, I actually just such I, a I have, glorious feat of the imagination. That's such an amazing book. Yep. I have uh, I have a, one quick question just based on your your uh, encyclopedic knowledge of Magica. So when I was putting this map together and I said, okay, on, in the second dominion, there's a comet that goes around the world instead of right. having it being it rotating around a sun. And he said, okay, well, what about the other three, the other two dominions, you know, does, what, do they have a comet? I said, I have no idea. I, I don't know. It, it was never mentioned in the other ones. And, yeah. and so it is hard to imagine like Geist the Witherer, the comet that, that goes is such a, um, it's sort of an iconic thing. And of course they, they use that as a vehicle to talk about the length of the day being different. But, you know, it does mention in the other uh, dominions as uh, Pi and Gentle were sort of making their first journey mm -hmm. across them, th that the, the daylight was different and the, the angle of the sun. But they aren't it is never clear whether it's our sun, if it's soul, you know, yeah. or if it's that dominion sun. Yeah, so that's a good point. That's that was yeah. never truly um, you know, Geis is the only one that's really identified as the the source of of light or you know the thing that in, creates the cycles in in the second dominion in my mind and, it's always been a different kind of star or sun oh i agree i think so yeah, too yeah, i think so mind. i mean that's yeah. i you know but that's the also the great thing is that it's so open to our interpretation sure. that you know it is hard and even, even when we was we were doing you know i was the art director on the magica project and people would send me uh you know their their prelim sketch, which I would then share with Clive. And most of the time, Clive was like, you know what? 
that I don't want to define. I don't want to say this is what this thing looks like. In fact, mm. I had such a struggle to get Clive to even do Pio Pa. He, he said there's only one image that he wanted to do because no one else knows what Pio Pa truly looks like. That to, to Clive, it was his thing. Like, so when this came, and I, you know, I don't know if uh, if folks can see it, and again, I apologize. Oh, yeah. I look like I'm on the set of Hoarders because I, <laughs> I'm in my attic for sound quality. But um, <laughs> there's a there's an exposed breast. Damn. It's a very very sort of Mona Lisa esque kind of blank, um, you know, half smile. Mm -hmm. uh, it but it does a great job of the fact that it's hard to tell is it male or is it female. Um, mm. the, the there's actually rips and tears in the actual paper. This was done on paper. And uh, because Clive oh. was trying to capture when Gentle was furiously, and remember, uh, Fury was one of uh, Gentle's names, John Fury Zacharias. Mm -hmm. um, he was furiously trying to trying to capture that image of what Pi looked like. And so he kept going and, and painting over and scratching back the canvas and digging out and gouging. So a lot of this is done with a palette knife and you can actually see the tears, um, which is why I ended up having to frame it behind glass because the... Uh, I was worried that with all of the exposed paper that it would eventually, you know, start to start to age and tarnish. But sure. Um, but anyway, the, the the great thing, even though there are images for each of these characters, that's they're still open to interpretation. So I, I love that there. He's yeah. in some things. I mean, like the Nullianak, he's very specific about the head, like uh, like praying hands and the lightning. Yeah. Other things he paints with a very wide paintbrush so that the reader is the one who's filling in the details. It's great yeah. that regardless of how much imagination creativity is in Imagica, uh, he leaves a little bit of yeah. room for the imagination of the reader. Yep. So yep. That's, that's a mark of a good author right there. Uh, another big one is, um, are the Dominions spheres like planets? Are they like a flat Earth sort of a thing? And do they overlap each other? That's how kind of how we imagined it with this. Matt, I, I think but... once you start to get into the uh, the physics of that, I honestly thought of them like you do as planets. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, is Earth being the succulent rock? My kind of thought was exactly that and that that where they overlap those sort of borders between is almost like a portal or it's like that, you know, uh, some sort of temporal we are going through it cloudy but, displacement yeah. thing yeah i mean yeah. It, it it's um it's almost like a shortcut if you will between um between one and the next but i think they are on their own when they were um you know obviously four of them were reconciled but when the fifth was out then it's sort of you know its own thing but it, yeah i think it when it becomes a circle it's a circle of five spheres that which there are sort of shortcuts between is how yeah. it's maybe uh, even a little bit left behind from the idea of fantasy kingdoms i would say where it's like this undefined area uh um, yeah. with lots of cities and geography but you don't really know so does it include the entire universe where that place is residing in or this is just that one area like the clouds yeah. just appear in london right it's just appear around that area in london sure. so even if you say england is like the fifth dominion then from there you can go anywhere you want the rest of the world and beyond so it, it just becomes kind of this, these little fantasy kingdoms right it's best yep. not to analyze them too much under the microscope um because like in the end it's all magic right yeah well and but if you go back to you know x amount a few hundred years ago the idea that we would fall off the edge of the world, you know, mm -hmm. was such that was a given, right? That was just or and yeah. that, that everything revolved around the earth. And so, um, you know, obviously we know better now, but it does take away some of the fantasy of it, it takes away some of the mystique that, um, you know, we want to hyper analyze everything and you lose yeah. a little bit of that, uh, that kind of. Yeah. I wouldn't put that beyond Clive to actually create some flat earth kingdoms because he created one for uh, Maximilian Bacchus and his flying circus. There's a, <laughs> oh, yeah. a right. chapter yeah, where yeah. a clown falls off the edge of the world and he just goes <laughs> yeah. straight down and hey, then he uh, shows I, up on the moon. You know, you, um, I, I think it was super funny when uh, during one of my uh, hospital stays, Clive was writing the Scarlet Gospels. And uh, we talked a lot during that time, which was great. He would he would either and if I wasn't if I was going through surgery, he would call and talk to my wife sometimes for an hour. I mean, he was just so uh, such a caring part of that. And, you know, I think yeah. you've spoken to Ron and Don or Don Bertram um, one yes. time before. And oh, Ron and Don times, yeah. um, live in Houston where I had all my surgeries and uh, they were always with me. They're just just wonderful guys. Um, but anyway, um, when he was writing the Scarlet Gospels, he said to me, he said, I'm, I've written you into the book. And 
it wasn't until, of course, when the book came out, I had no idea where it was. So there is a bar. Uh, Rufert's in, Deli. Yeah, that's right. Or Deli. Sorry. Yes. Rufert's Deli <laughs> in there, which I thought was pretty, pretty dang uh, funny yeah. that, uh, that, uh, I mean, the character is not, nothing like me, but I think it's awesome that I got a little, uh, I got a little shout out in a deli there. We, we got wonderful. written into the end of that book too. There's uh, Armando and Ryan help uh, oh, yeah. Mary Damore move at the end. Oh, of the nice. Book. I yeah. run away from the box and you're the guy who starts looking at the box and then. Yeah. It's so awesome. Fun to uh, be able to go in and see that and know, hey, Rufert's Deli. And like, yep. I know who Hans Rufert yeah, is. That's right. That's I right. know yeah. what this means. I know what's behind yeah. this thing. And it, it exactly. gives you a, a, a different appreciation of more Easter eggs there. Yes, more Easter eggs, right? Like, I, to this day, I mean, I've had this book since, you know, 1991, 1992. And uh, well, not this particular edition. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I've, you know, looking at, I've looked at this one. This is my workbook. It's actually a remainder edition. You know, it's, oh, yeah. bought, bought it for like a penny. Sure. Um, incredible, a penny, but I know, but I got it off of, of Amazon and I used it as a work copy when we have to do an episode about a magic or something. This is the one sure. that ends up get, getting all the, the post-its on it. Um, but I've never noticed in the background that there were two people in that particular print that you yeah, showed me. And Vanef, yeah. And 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 the funniest thing, you know, that it's you and yep. uh, and uh, Richard Kirk. So yep. that's great. That is one of those things that I feel like, you know, once you know that, it's always been there. It's like now I can't yep. look yeah. at this and not well, see it. And same with that cover. Now you can't look at that cover and realize, hang on a second, it never never dawned on me that this cover makes absolutely no sense for this book. But oh well. yeah, 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 it's, it's like, just sort of generic, you know. Yeah. Richard Kirk oh. also was nice enough to allow us to use his artwork for our D and D game. So, oh, like, good. if so, if everybody's fighting a a, a gecka gek, then I can perfect put the gecka gek up on the screen and say, "Here's your enemy that you're fighting." I, I'm a Urethemek wizard, so I've got my <laughs> there you go. uh, my ribbon sword. Uh, Very so cool. I'm a blade so, singer. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, if you if you're familiar with D and D, you, you probably know what a blade singer is. So, oh, uh, listen, I played D and D. I still have somewhere my first edition. So I was born in seventy two, and what, the original one came out in what seventy eight, seventy seven, somewhere in there. Seventy four. Seventy four yeah. was it? So, but yeah. I still have those original ones because when I was probably 10, 11, 12, we started playing D and D. Um, haven't I, in a I long have time. Mine too. But anyway, it's it's a big part of my uh, of my early childhood. I still think the best game that Wizards of the Coast, not TSR, but mm -hmm. Wizards of the Coast, the best game they ever made is a game called Twitch. And if you guys are oh. gamers, it is the most stupid quick action card game that they don't make anymore. Oh. But if you can find a copy of Twitch, we have on so many game nights, we think, well, let's play half an hour of Twitch and then we'll sit down and play Robo Rally or we'll play, you know, Settlers of Catan or Carcassonne or whatever mm -hmm. we're playing. And we would get into Twitch, and it is so um, uh, contagious. And it's this it, again. It's just I won't, won't bore you with the details, but it's one of those sort of party games that is even like the most you know crazy hardcore gamer loves that game. So if you can find oh. Twitch, um, it is worth whatever somebody's charging for. We've had we have played we've had so much fun playing Twitch. And even while we were designing Magica, we we traveled. Uh, to a lot of these sort of trade conventions doing promotion before the game came out. And we would always bring Twitch with us and we would play, we would demo all these other games and we would end up back in a hotel room playing Twitch until two in the morning. So, Last episode, we spoke with uh, Stephen Dressler, who at the oh, time yeah. was, and Cheryl Benson, who at yep. the time were running the Lost Souls fan club. Yeah. And they were the ones who gave me my first uh, Imagica card because I was in Portugal at the time. I, I moved to the United States in 2013 when I married my wife. And um, so it was, it was the saddest thing to be a Clive Barker fan in, in Portugal in the nineties, because we <laughs> didn't have any translations of Clive Barker in Portugal. Um, we had one, the damnation game in two mm. volumes, actually that now that I think about it, but it was only one translation. So I, I basically, since I started learning English when I was seven, I, I would just read Clive and imported books coming from England in the original English. And I became a member of the Lost Souls fan club. And the first issue that I got from the newsletter, it was the Clive Barker uh, card, the one with the yeah. oh yeah, yeah. his yep. face in the front. And it's like yeah. yeah, Ken Meyer Jr. did that uh, did that image. Yeah, um, yeah. So I actually met um, Cheryl and Stephen Dresler, Cheryl Green, Benson Green, mm -hmm. and um, she was Cheryl Benson at the time, and Stephen Dresler in Atlanta at that convention where I met Clive. 
Um, and they were there with the Beth, uh, Beth Cutler gallery. So, right, right, um, yeah. and so they had a, they had a very fledgling relationship with Clive at that time as well. And so we immediately became friends. And then once they kind of learned about the game, they of course wanted to, they were big supporters of that. And, but they had somebody who was doing the layout of the, of the, their Lost Souls publication who kind of bowed out for whatever reason. And they had no idea how to do like actual layout. And because I had all the software that, you know, starting to do like Quark Express or whatever it was at the time. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah, Quark was kind of the the thing. And uh, th I had the Power PC, which was the first Mac clone, uh, right. which was a big deal back then because, yeah. you know, it, anyway, ancient history now. But they asked me, hey, would you mind doing the doing the layout? So there was a handful of, uh, of issues that I did the layout for uh, just sort of as a why not. Um, so that was fun. They were, they're good folks and I'm still friends with, with both of them. And that's kind of the cool thing too, is that, you know, the, the family surrounding Clive, um, it's pretty damn good people. I mean, I, yeah. I've, I've only met one person that I would say was, was trying to siphon something off of Clive. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I have never asked Clive for anything, never once. Uh, and I, I think, um, I think there's something about that. And, he had some some medical issues right at the same time I was having medical issues and we, we just right. bonded uh, on a on a lot of things like that. But anyway, my, my point being is that the the extended Clyde Barker family is just a it's just a great group of people yeah. across the board. Yeah. And, and, and uh, mm -hmm. two episodes back, we had Phil and Sarah on, which was yeah. amazing. Ten years we've been working on on getting them on the podcast and we finally right. able to do it. Because they've yeah, always I been, you know, exactly the people in the mean. shadows running things and stuff. So they've always yeah. been super busy. But the other thing I got off of the Lost Souls newsletter was a, um, a small print of Piopa. And I don't remember if that was like a promotional thing from like the card game or if that was something from a best scuttler gallery thing i'm not no. sure so um we did a a number of prints as a promotional thing for the card game and that was kind of mm -hmm. early on uh and then from that so my my mother-in-law uh, who just recently passed away but she was an amazing artist in fact uh, she did a couple she did tisha lule and she did uh jokalelao i think oh. uh, rebecca bryan was her name uh but anyway when i was working with all of these artists i it, it kept there was this repeating theme that they were getting so screwed when they wanted to make prints. Mm -hmm. Printmaking was such an expensive thing for an artist. And a lot of these artists, I mean, they're, um, they don't get paid a ton of money for these images, right? I mean, um, especially the reproduction yeah. artists, like comic book artists, like Tom Taggart and Ted McKeever. So when they would go to these conventions, they would want to make limited edition prints. They were just getting, it was highway robbery and they were, the printers were requiring them to have a, you know, a thousand print run or 500 print run. Well, they didn't need, they needed a 50 print run. Right. So we, my, my wife and I, again, in the frustration, we were trying to help uh, my mother-in-law make prints just all, this is, this is highway robbery. So we went to Clive and we kind of put, pitched to him the idea of investing. So we together invested in a, a Gicle printer and started making canvas prints for Clive. And we also started making canvas prints for a lot of our artists that we worked with on Imagica. And so we started this little artist collective, uh, artist collective called Luna 7. Yeah. And oh, Luna 7 right. was, um, was really designed to be sort of a co-op in that, you know, we, we didn't start it to make money. We started it so that they could make money. And so we just kind of became a facilitator in that, um, you know, obviously there are expenses in the ink and the canvas and whatever, but it was a fraction of what the uh, the big printers were trying to to print with them. So we did that That really is until my health kind of went really downhill. But I loved the fact that we were able to help these artists create something that lasted forever and was museum quality and was they were able to turn around and actually make some money on the the things that they spent so much labor doing that again most of the the print the lithograph makers and the g clay printers at the time were just charging ridiculous um i mean 80 times what it actually costs they were the, these sure. printers were doing uh, and they were the, controlling then, the market yeah. yeah and then the artist had to turn around and try to charge a fan who a fan would you know, not a not a high end art collector, but a genuine fan. They'll spend fifty or seventy five bucks on a nice print. They're not going to spend eight hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. And so, like Mark Ryden, I don't know if you know that artist. Um, you know, he was yeah. really big in that time, and he was charging eight ten grand a print for the exact coming off the exact same machine that we had. 
Yeah. Um, and we were charging 75 or 100 bucks a print. And, and, I, and it allowed the artist to make some money. So I'm super proud that we were able to do that as well. And of course, technology's come now to where most artists can afford their own printer and do it you know, from their own home. Um, but right. yeah. Yeah, Clive had a, a big printer in his house when we visited. Uh, where they were doing the museum quality prints yeah, of yeah. Aberrant paintings and stuff like that, when they yep. were taking pictures of the images for the Imaginer books, which was a fantastic process. We got to go visit that because yeah. we we helped out with the whole Occupy Midian thing for yeah, the nice three directors cut. Yeah, and uh, the Russell Charrington, right? Was that? Uh, yeah, was that yeah. Russell? yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually, was... we we uh, my family owned for forty three years. We owned a hotel and restaurant, and he came and stayed. And why am I forgetting the guy, the actor's name uh, who played Boone? Craig uh, Sheffer. Yeah, Sheffer, he, he yeah. came as well. So they stayed at our hotel for three days oh, and, wow. and had dinner together and whatnot as, as they were kind of going around doing the promotion of that. So again, was, such a small world. Like what a what a cool sure. interconnected world of all this, all these strings <laughs> yeah. here. Were you talking about the Woodbridge Inn in Jasper? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the moving in, in into your your life and your career a little bit more. Uh, that's where you grew up, right? You guys, uh, you, your parents run the restaurant? Yeah, we bought it in, uh, so I was born in 72. They bought it in the winter of 75. We opened it in January wow. of 76. And it's an old railroad hotel. And actually, I, I still live right next door to it. Um, but it was built in 1880. There's a, as the name implies, there's a wooden bridge that crosses over the railroad tracks. There's a, there's an old water tower right next to it. Um, and so it's just really picturesque. Uh, it was built by a guy that went um, after the Civil War. He went to California during the gold rush and actually made a bunch of money. So he came back to his hometown and opened a little hotel and restaurant. Uh, and so since 1880, it was originally called the Lenning Hotel. And then mm -hmm. um, I think in 1950, they changed the name to the Woodbridge Inn. And it's been a hotel and restaurant ever since. Yeah, and like a small hotel, less than 20 rooms or something yep, like that. Yep, yeah. it's exactly right. 18 rooms. Um, there were six rooms in the original hotel building. And then my family in 1982 built a, an additional 12 rooms in a separate building. Mm -hmm. But we lived uh, from 75 until uh, 1996. We lived above the restaurant. So my entire life, I grew up in the restaurant from age four. I'm not kidding. We have photos wow. of me in my pajamas, shucking oysters or standing on a milk crate, um, washing dishes. So I am 100% a restaurant child. And to this day, I mean, it is tough to go out to eat with me, not because I'm a snob, but because I'm, I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, why aren't they clearing their plates? And those people are ready for their check. And like nobody's refilling their drinks. And uh, my my family is so embarrassed, but I will get up and refill people's iced tea or water in a restaurant that I don't work at. Like if I, if you know, if I see somebody sitting there and I'm thirsty and my glass is empty and the waitress is busy, I'm like, the hell, I'm just going to go, you know, do it. And they're like, do you work here? I'm like, no, don't work here, but you're thirsty and I'm thirsty. And so I'm going to do this. Uh, so yeah, hospitality is a huge part of my life. Um, I did an internship with Disney when I was in college and um, I, Disney, you can say what you want about them. They are masters at, at hospitality. Um, I know they've they've taken a few, uh, you know, uh, intellectual properties and run wild with them. But as far as a hospitality entity, they have they've written the book. And the cool thing about hospitality is it's not just hotels and restaurants and theme parks. It's every day. All of us have the ability to make somebody's day better. And even even a couple of days ago, I was down in Savannah um, on, a, on a little business trip and I saw these two girls that were desperately trying to take a selfie with this giant oak tree and there's no way that they could have taken a selfie and gotten the magnitude. And so of I just course. walked up and said, Hey guys, can I take your picture or whatever? And they're like, Oh my God. Yeah. So that little moment of hospitality, they will forever have that memory, but we're also afraid like, well, I don't know. I don't want to be, you know, weird or whatever, but just being friendly and polite and accommodating. And especially when I was in the hospital, you know, the word hospitality has, has hospital in it. But mm -hmm. when you're when you're sick and you're I mean, even even today with your endoscopy, Ryan, you yeah. know, there are times that somebody just makes you feel human. They're like, you know, are you are you warm? Do you need a blanket? They address you by your name. They make you feel comfortable. And there are other times where a doctor will come into the room and they won't even say good morning to you in the hospital. But they'll look at your chart and I'm like, oh, hey, patient number six, five, five, one, two, seven. They're, yeah. you know, have an elevated cretinine or whatever. They don't look at you and address you and make you feel like I'm going to get better. So I. I, I get passionate about it and I apologize for taking this on a wild, uh, you know, dog leg here, but no. I think that all of us every day, whether it's complimenting what somebody's wearing, whether it's just, yeah. you know, I go through my contacts regularly and reach out to people that I haven't talked to in a while just to say, number one, check on them, let them know I'm thinking about them. Anytime somebody pops into my brain that I haven't talked to in a while, I'll take a second and text or email or, or even write to them if I need to. 
Um, just to let them know I'm thinking about them. Ask if there's anything I can do for them because I genuinely believe that we get what we want out of life by helping enough other people get what they want out of life. Wow. And it, 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 I've seen it happen. It comes back to you a zillion fold. And again, I, I'm not some kumbaya, you know, spiritual wackadoo. I, I've seen it happen that, you know, you, you put it out there, it comes back to you tenfold. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was a long answer to your question. I, but I, yes, I grew up in the, in the restaurant business uh, in 2019 when that was actually the date of my last surgery. Things got really bad again. Three separate times they told me I'd be dead by morning which my wife just says illustrates how damn stubborn I am mm -hmm. and how poorly I listen to direction. But anyway, uh, I, I was really almost killing myself trying to work in, in the, and run the restaurant and the hotel. And if I wasn't there, it was just a different experience. And I'm, finally in 2019, we just realized this is stupid. I mean, we are, I, I'm going to survive all of these medical challenges just to stress myself to death and give myself a heart attack in the restaurant business. So we bowed out in 2019, but I still do a little bit of hospitality consulting. And, um, and as I said, that's, that's just a huge part of my life. And I'm always, uh, I'm either consulting with restaurants or I do a lot of, uh, especially before the pandemic, I do a lot of uh, cooking and nutrition demonstrations for stomach cancer patients, because, you know, I didn't know prior to losing my stomach that you could live without a stomach. I mean, like who knew? I mean, I, I right. thought the stomach was pretty much like one of the most important organs but in reality the stomach is just this glorified toxic waiting room it's like purgatory for food uh, no digestion happens really in the stomach it's just getting food ready for digestion and all digestion happens in the intestine so i i have no stomach again no esophagus so my um i had to relearn how to eat and i and i i do a nutritional video series now with the gastric cancer foundation called the gesundheit kitchen and uh, it is really for anybody that eats food, you will learn something from that series. So even though my I'll I'm speaking really quick here, what's that? I'll, I'll, I'll share. Oh, that. gotcha. What, what, gotcha. There gotcha. We go. There we go. There we go. So, yeah, the, it says right there, Gesundheit means health. It's a, sort of a wish of health. Like, I think Americans sometimes think that uh, they hear somebody sneeze and somebody says Gesundheit and they just assume that Gesundheit means God bless. It really means it's a wish of health. Like, so if you're speaking of health, it is your Gesundheit. But if you say Gesundheit to someone, it is a wish of good health. And I, I, anytime I'm signing a book or do anything, I always sign it as Gesundheit because I feel like if I could wish anybody anything, it is good health. Because if you don't have that, you really have nothing, right? And you, oh, you, yeah. you learn that when you, uh, when you become health compromised. So, um, so yeah, I do a lot of traveling, speaking at hospitals or wellness centers. Uh, in 2018, I was in Bucharest, I was in Budapest, I was in Eindhoven, Netherlands, I was in uh, Leipzig, Germany. Uh, and it was just again this year in June, I was in Leipzig. I'm going to Japan next year to speak at a conference. Wow. Um, so I do a lot of traveling and speaking to um, not only patients and caregivers, but also to the to the medical community because again, too often they hand you just a stack of Xerox. Um, you know, photocopied, here's what you should eat. Yeah. And there's nothing inspiring there. And you're already overwhelmed. Well, like, you know, I have uh, I and got it's one not of those in my fridge right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's and it, it it's um, it is overwhelming. And also it can be conflicting because oftentimes a nutritionist after a surgery is working under the assumption that you have a stomach, like that you have a full GI system. But the way if you don't have a stomach, you have to eat like a diabetic. You have to worry about your sugars and your carbs. You have to worry about it's hard to digest meat. It's not that I, you know, I don't eat meat, I'm, but I'm a 95% vegetarian because I can't really digest meat. I have no stomach acid. Right. So um, oh, yeah. anyway, it's it's a challenge. And uh, when I was first diagnosed when 1990, sorry, in 2005, I'm getting my decades confused here. My century is confused. Um, in 2005, <laughs> when I was diagnosed, I'd just uh, been on the Next Food Network Star, which is a big reality cooking competition. Yeah. And um, so I was on season one, which no one remembers. Uh, season two is the season with Guy Fieri, which everybody remembers. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, I had cancer during that competition. I finished third that year. But um, quick story, I, about two weeks after the taping of the finale, I went into the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack. And uh, again, ridiculously long story short, uh, I had a tumor that they estimated to be at least two years old that was bleeding internally. And my um, I had the blood level, the uh, oxygen level of an infant. Um, you you, know, you was, drove yourself to the hospital and, and I, you had to yeah. stop on the way, right? Yeah. I was on my way to the hospital and um, I, again, I was having tunnel vision. The left side of my body was going numb. Classic heart attack symptoms. I called 911 saying I am having a heart attack. And um, 
the first doctor that saw me saw that my blood level is so lay so low and was about to discharge me saying that I was simply anemic and I needed to eat more red meat. And now at the time oh. I was a bigger guy, I was about 225 pounds at the time. And, um, and that was his, that was his answer is, you know, but then luckily uh, there was a bit of a changing of the guards. The next doctor came in and saw my stats and said, no, no, this guy's got to be bleeding internally. And she had the sense to do an endoscopy much like you had today, uh, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. But um, hopefully they didn't find what they found in me, which was a tumor that sat right at the GI junction, right where my esophagus and my stomach met. And uh, it was large. It was bleeding. It was angry. Um, and again, hyper, long story short, they originally removed half of my stomach, half of my esophagus. And then five years later or seven years later, I had to go in and remove the rest of it. Um, but my point was, at that time, if you were to... It wasn't Google at the time. It was probably Ask Jeeves or I don't know what the uh, what the what Alta the search engine yeah Netflix, Netflix or not yeah. Netflix uh, Net what was the one uh, Netscape Alta, Netscape Navigator Netscape, yeah. yeah Netscape Navigator I, I it was one of those one, yeah. so uh, anyway when you when you did a web search of stomach cancer or gastric cancer every thread was an obituary and. I get it. All of our stories in an obituary, but these were these were grim. Like there was no success story, uh, and I, they were out there. But no, there were there were more people just saying my husband just passed from stomach cancer, or you start to read someone's blog, and then it, the next post would be that you know this person had passed away. So um, from a very early point, my wife said you need to you need to blog about this, and so I started blogging, and the blog still lives somewhere. But I basically went through step by step everything that was going on as it was going on, and because I'd had so many people sort of following me from the Next Food Network thing, I had a lot of people. I, had, I think at one point it was like forty thousand people that were daily reading the the blog, and I was featured on wow. AOL on right. their you know story of the day or whatever. But um, I I was so happy that I could be a lighthouse for people. I, I did have one older gentleman that reached out to me. His name was Jim, and Jim had had his stomach removed about ten years earlier than me. He reached out to me after seeing me online and and became my mentor. He became my lighthouse, and he he's still alive. He's uh, I think he's seventy eight now, and he's doing great. And he doesn't have a stomach. He doesn't have an esophagus, and of course he has problems. We all have problems, but he became my my focal point. And um, I, I, I'm glad that I can be that for somebody. I'm glad that my story and now more and more stories are out there so that someone that is going through uh, a, a rough medical condition can, can see a little bit of optimism. Uh, I think I'm optimistic to a fault. I'm, I'm realistic. I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to, you know, sprout an extra stomach tomorrow. I'm not that Pollyanna. Um, but I, you know, I think happiness is not a um it's not something that happens to you it is a decision it's a choice it's not a person place or a thing it is a decision so even if i'm going into surgery and i know it's going to be rough you know i'm not going to take it out on the the orderly that's wheeling me down there i'm not going to be angry about it i'm going to just make the you know make chicken salad out of chicken shit pardon my french i mean you 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 got to play <laughs> You got to play the hand that you dealt. Yeah, so I was yeah. I was dealt a pretty rough hand, um, but I'm I'm every day making it a conscious effort to to make the best out of it. Are there days that are that I don't feel like that? Absolutely. And so those are the days I go for an extra long walk, or I, I um, like the rest of the country. I've been playing pickleball, and I'm a I used to play go. used to play tennis competitively, and they had to remove two. Um, you can kind of see I'm missing a couple ribs oh. on this side, and they had to remove a, a major shoulder muscle. And so I couldn't play tennis anymore. So I got into pickleball as a sort of therapy or, or um, yeah, physical therapy, I yeah, guess. Yeah, physical therapy, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and fell in love with it. So again, I'm, I'm playing with a guy that's 90 years old and I'm inspired wow. to see that this guy's out there still playing every day. So it's, you know, some people see it as a bit of a joke sport. I love it for the social, the mental, the physical. And again, if I'm feeling depressed or feeling like a has been or like, a, you know, I'm I'm hurting that day or whatever, I go out for, you know, two hours and play pickleball and all of that just washes away. So, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, there's, there's so much stuff that you put out there uh, 11 years ago or even more than that. And it's still out there inspiring people. I myself immersed myself in some of the stuff that you put out there today. And uh, I ended up buying your book, Eat Like There's No Tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I oh. bought some Thailand black rice and I bought a three pounds of quinoa. Oh, nice. Just, just because <laughs> I was so inspired by reading. I, I even saw a TED talk by Julia Enders and I learned oh, yeah. so much. Like, 
who would have imagined that we eat 50,000 tons of food and, and drink 8,000 gallons of liquids in our lifetime? That Listen, I, I, Julia Enders, fake. I just, if I can put a plug in for, I've never met her. I'd love to. She's a German um, kind of gastroenterologist mm -hmm. and she has a book. It's called Guts, I think. Is that the yeah. name of the book? I'm, yeah. yeah guts. Um, it is such a good read and it sort of anthropomorphizes our GI system, but also it, it's, it's this great testimonial to our entire immune system is our is in our guts, like the, the biome that, you know, yeah. it's such a testament to it's the, you are what you eat and not in a preachy way, not in talking down to you way, but just re a realistic, like, look, you are, you know, you are basically a giant bus for billions of bacteria that, that control our uh, everything. Right. And like I said, from our immune system to our moods, to our just overall well being, to our- uh, Even more uh, bacteria than human cells in our body. So. Oh yeah, I mean, it's in, it's insane. I mean, it really is insane when you start reading about it and, and it, it gives you a fresh perspective and nothing gives you fresh perspective like somebody saying you're dying uh, right. and also somebody ripping out half of your GI system. So. You know, the, the thing about it, too, I, I think that to me was the strongest analogy um, when you think about like as an artist, like if somebody said to you, draw something, well, what? I mean, it could be a cat. It could be a, a Zeppelin, a dirigible. I mean, it could be a camel. It could be like, what am I? There's too many options if somebody's just said, draw something. And I think for people that have GI issues, whether it's celiacs or whether they're diabetic or whether they don't have a stomach, rather than thinking oh no i can't eat this stuff anymore it gives you hyper focus because now i don't have to worry about all the stuff that i can't eat i now have this razor sharp focus of on the things that i can eat like quinoa like you mentioned which is a complete protein and it is so good um and it can be used in so many different ways and it is the perfect human chow and you probably heard me say that i mean if, if i were to have a pet human and i had to pick one food to feed that pet human it would be quinoa it literally is nutritionally everything that a human needs to survive Right. And most of the food that we're that we buy, sadly, is, you know, over processed and over salted and, and it's preserved. And again, I don't want to get preachy about it, but once you kind of learn these things, it becomes inspiring. And the, then it's it's fun again, because you have this sort of like like a horse has race blinders on. I don't have to worry about the, the crap and the things that I that I can't. And eat it puts anymore. you in control. It puts oh, you in control of, of what 100%. goes into your body, which I yeah. think most people nowadays tend to take for granted. And we don't. I was actually just talking to uh, my wife, Sarah. We were discussing a meal for the weekend where we're going to replace couscous with quinoa because yeah. I don't eat gluten because it causes me tremendous discomfort. Sure. Um, I'm still working on finding out whether or not I'm celiac or if this is just one of those things that one day your body just decides I've had enough of this thing. I'm not going to yeah. digest it anymore. So, um, but it takes a lot of discipline to change your diet. Um, just giving up gluten, for example, just giving up things that have wheat in it yeah. takes away a whole bunch of stuff that we are used to thinking as comfort yeah. food, like pastas and bread and this and that. And yeah. then you have to replace it with potatoes and, you know, other things and, and and so it it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of uh, discipline to be able to tell yourself I want to feel good I don't want to feel bad with what I eat I don't want to wake up tomorrow and be like I'm breaking out I'm yeah. having discomfort with my bowels or whatever oh yeah it's like you decide that okay well maybe meal prep is a the way to go instead of just buying frozen stuff off the supermarket like a lot of people do because let's be honest lots of people don't think about their organs we just yeah. see we ourselves take them for in the granted. mirror and we just think if you cut me open it's nothing in here but like magic it's, yeah yeah it's yeah. it's just a bunch of flesh and maybe some light coming out of it or something i don't know it's like <laughs> they don't realize that you can do whatever you want in terms of diet when you're in your 20s or something but then once you reach your 30s 40s 50s at some point, you're going to be carrying bad habits from when you were young that your body is not going to be able to, you know, digest or metabolize yeah. or use. And, and a lot of people just end up developing all sorts of diseases, heart disease, liver disease, you know, all this stuff. You really have to be conscious. And I think immersing myself in, in, in your uh, But I Digest podcast, uh, you know, reading your blog, looking at uh, the videos of interviews that you did even though I have a stomach, but I became inspired to be more careful about what I put into my body just because you're such a great communicator. Well, thank you. You, just, you have this kind of like contagious energy. That I, that's, really 
Yeah. You know, the word the word contagious since uh, since COVID is a different thing. But I, I know what you <laughs> I mean. <know. laughs> uh, I, I, and I appreciate that. But I, I do get crazy enthusiastic about it because you're right. We are responsible. No one has ever forced me since I've been in diapers. No one's ever force fed me to eat anything. Right. So we it's now what the one thing not having a stomach has done is it's given me almost a superpower. So when you have a stomach and you eat something that whether you know you have celiacs or whether you're diabetic or whether you just overeat you don't normally feel the effects of that until later right it could be hours later it could be the next right. day right and so then we make the mistake of sometimes villainizing the last the most recent thing we ate because if we ate breakfast and now we feel sick we blame what we had for breakfast but the reality is it very well could have been the thing you had for lunch the previous day it could have been the previous breakfast depending on right. how fast your system is now not having a stomach not to be too graphic, but food goes through me much quicker because there's a lot less of me for it to go through, right? I mean, the, the plumbing is highly redacted. Right. So if I eat like crap, if I eat greasy, heavy, overcooked, overprocessed, I feel like crap. I feel greasy and overcooked and overprocessed and lethargic and foggy headed. And I do so many things in, in the span of a day. And again, inspired by Clyde Barker, who genuinely inspired me to extract more out of every day. Mm -hmm. um, but I have so much energy because I feed this machine. I mean, if you if you reduce it to pure, you know, mechanics, this is a machine and food is fuel. And it, it's very unromantic to think of it that way. But that's the reality. Mm -hmm. So if you are if I'm putting diesel in an electric hybrid, it's not going to work. Right. So you have to pick the right fuel for the right. If I put if I put diesel in my push lawnmower, it's not going to work because it's the wrong fuel for that for that machine. Right so. On. And all of our machines are slightly different. I mean, they're calibrated differently, right? I mean, we're different from different ethnicities and different different regional backgrounds. And um, so we and and just DNA, we're different. So we have to find what are those things that work for us, and then you know, kind of keep stay within those lanes. And it does take discipline, but there's a fun way to do it. And I I think again, if you take charge of that, you're grabbing the reins and going, I am responsible for what's going into this machine the outcome will be so much so much better on every level and i and i'm not saying about you know weight loss or whatever that's all a separate issue and some people are trying to gain weight some people are trying to, to lose weight i'm just talking about you being the best version of yourself is going to start happening by putting the right fuel in your machine there's you i'll get off my soapbox <laughs> but you got to take baby steps right because oh, yeah. because like for example uh every time like you know so my wife fluctuates between eating meat and sometimes goes through vegetarian periods sure. or even vegan ones. And I tend to accompany that because it's like, why not? It's just a different kind of food. And right. um, I found a lot of interesting things in vegan cuisine and, and vegetarians. Cause to be honest, we don't eat enough veggies. I mean, most sure. of us don't. Um, and suffering from things like fatty liver or, uh, you know, uh, cholesterol, which are things that unfortunately I have, um, yeah, I mean, I just realized yesterday we got the blood work from our cat and turns out our cat's diet needs to change because he's developing the initial stages of kidney disease. Mm. And I know that's something you can't really like cure, but but you can prevent. So now we've been tackling this elaborate plan to change our cat's diet, but you can't just change everything overnight, right? Because otherwise people are going to have issues and they're yeah. not going to have a good time and they're going to be like, oh, I missed this. I missed that. And it baby steps is the way to go really 100 percent. and going back to your gut biome and these billions of bacteria that we're lugging around we change the the makeup and the population of that bacteria based on what we eat so if you're a drive-through person and you're eating a lot of processed foods and a lot of sugary and a lot of greasy foods the population of your gut bacteria is going to favor that type of bacteria that does well in that environment so the, this absolutely happened to me. Not that I was eating a lot of uh, drive through food, but I did eat a lot of meat, a lot of um, uh, a lot of snack food because I was traveling a lot and I was eating, you know, sometimes on the fly. Sure. So when I was first diagnosed, I did, oh, my God, I'm changing my diet. And I did it, um, you know, too fast. And I did too much too fast. And at that time, juicing was all the rage. And so I was juicing everything and eating a lot of raw foods. And it was causing a lot of GI problems. I mean, cramping and just, I mean, you know, horrible problems yeah and it was it takes time even beans i mean people always joke about beans being the musical fruit it that's only because the bacteria in your gut aren't you don't have the right balance and right ratio of bacteria 
So once you eat, if you eat beans every day, you don't have any of those bloating issues that you have from somebody who rarely eats them and then eats beans. So it is just like exercise. And I always tell people that if you decided tomorrow you're going to go to the gym and start working out and you started with the 100 pound um, dumbbells and you did 40 reps of the 100 pound dumbbells, the next day you're like, oh my God, I'm allergic to exercise. And you can't even. You're going to be worse off. Yeah. And you can't even lift your, you can't even lift your arm to brush your teeth. You're so sore. And then you think, oh, I can't do exercise. I, you know, it didn't work for me. So you start with the five pounds and then you work up to the 10 and then to the 20 and you do smaller reps. So it's the same with that. And so I'm glad you mentioned that because people oftentimes get inspired to eat healthy food and they go to Whole Foods and they buy everything expensive and they eat it all. And then they sit, you know, half a day in the bathroom or they have cramps or they break out. And it's just because it was too much too fast. You have to absolutely, you know, it's just like driving a, a cruise ship. You can't, you can't make a sharp right. You got to slowly turn that boat around. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a good, it's uh, a good point. I can talk food all day long. You guys are going to have to shut me up on food. Otherwise, I'm going to be talking. Well, (laughs) for me, the the, the reason I had my endoscopy today and and that I have been going to the doctor lately is because I'm I'm pre-diabetic. And Mm. and so I've I've stopped eating sugar and carbohydrates and I dropped a whole bunch of weight already just in a couple of weeks. But um, but the weird thing is that that my whole my whole system changed or like my taste buds have changed like yep. i had i had a corn on the cob i'm like what kind of corn is this this is like the best corn i've ever eaten and it it tasted like candy it was super right. sweet yep. and it was just because i'm not used to eating sugar anymore no That's, it's a great thing and there's so many great sugar substitutes out there that it's a lot easier now to go sugar free my my favorite is one called pure cane uh and I it's saw uh, that in your last yeah, yeah. Day video uh yeah, yeah. For uh, yeah, for the uh, Gazoo Cancer Kitchen. Cancer Foundation. Yeah, I, I found I, out about that today. Yeah, and, and it, it's actually made from sugar cane, but they do some sort of fermentation process where so it acts like sugar, it bakes like sugar. And this is not an ad for pure cane, I promise you. But I've gone through tons of different ones because I I'm not a diabetic, but I play one on TV. Uh, no, but I, I I really have a hard time with sugar because my pancreas releases what it thinks is the right amount of insulin, but because mm-hmm. my system is so so uh, redacted and shortened. Right. Um, it's too much insulin. And so I'll, I'll have, there's these... no storage in the stomach yeah, yeah. for it to yeah. go. Yeah. So I have these wild ups and downs. Uh, so I, I cut out and originally I was using stevia and I still use stevia quite a bit, but stevia does have a little bit of an herbally taste to it. Um, and so when pure cane came out, um, of the stevias, I like Truvia the best because it is the most sugar like. Um, but when pure cane came out, uh, it, it really does check all the boxes. And again, I am not promoting a brand. I'm just, this is just anecdotally. It's the brand that I really uh, have loved and they make a powdered sugar version. They make a brown sugar version. Um, they make a three times, like normally it's one to one where one spoon of pure cane equals one spoon of sugar, but they make one for your tea, which is, uh, one is equal to two or whatever. Anyway. I'm, but the I'm glycemic sold, index is, yeah, is it's, it's zero. I mean, zero. it's a, it's a yeah. zero glycemic index. And that's, yeah. you know, I, if for those, if somebody's listening, going, what the hell is glycemic index? It really is just sort of a measure of how, um, how much, uh, how it spikes your blood sugar. Right. And uh, so diabetics typically like to eat a low or zero glycemic index uh, kind of diet, which sometimes can be a little um, difficult if, at first, but now that there are so many options out there uh, like xylitol or Zorbitol and, um, and stevia and pure cane, things like that. It's, it's a lot easier to make those changes um, and have the health benefits without giving up the, the taste side. And this Thanksgiving, you too can experience what it's like to have a glycemic crash when you eat some uh, pumpkin pie with ready whip on top. Oh, you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you, you want to go take a podcast. nap. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was a good reference to our uh, most recent episode of But I Digest. So I will mention, so the podcast that uh, my friend Steve McDonough, who actually was the winner of season one of the Next Food Network star, he and his uh, husband, Dan Smith, um, we, we've stayed friends all these years. And um, during the pandemic, I, I had this idea for a, a food themed podcast, but really not not just like history in a boring kind of a way. I wanted to do the history, the heroes, but also the hoopla, the kind of the weird um, backstory of food, because so many foods really, I mean, the fact that the reason that that Amsterdam, I mean, that, that New York is now New York and no longer New Amsterdam is because of nutmeg. Uh, and it's, it's insane. <laughs> and I, I won't go into the entire thing, but the whole reason that the Dutch sold New York to the Brits where it was over nutmeg. Uh, so if you'll have to listen to the nutmeg episode or 
people think that croissants are from France. They're not from France at all. They are from uh, Austria. And so there's, I love that weird food history and the culture around food and the ceremony and the, um, I mean, it's weird, right? I mean, it, it's, it's the uh, almost holy reverence we give to certain foods. And then we villainize, like it's okay for us to eat cow, but it's not okay for us to eat horse. But in some countries, that's what they eat. In fact, in Mongolia, mare's milk, horse milk is what, you know, they think it's weird that somebody drinks cow's milk. And honestly, it is weird that we're drinking cow's, cow's milk. Sure. Um, that humans, like, why are we drinking the lactic excre excretions from another mammal? It makes no sense. What other wasn't, animal does that? Wasn't goat um, milk the most drunk milk? Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, yeah. and goat milk is the most digestible of all the animal milks, actually camel and goat. Um, the fat molecule is more uh, similar to human milk, and so it's easier for us to digest. But uh, I, over the years, being in this industry my entire life, I, I've picked up so many weird little food factoids. So we started doing a podcast, but I love the digression. So it's a conversation, and as you can tell from this conversation, I love to kind of go down the little rabbit holes and side things. It's hard to keep me on track. I'm sorry. Uh, no, but it's great. the idea of instead of but I digress, we thought, well, but I digest. It's a great uh, title. We, well, I love thank the you. Title. And, so and, we, and we have a great time. And Steve, um, he's a pop culture kind of a guy. So there's always some kind of fun pop culture. He always has a fun quiz uh, in there. So like any podcast, we need more listeners. We need more subscribers. We need more people interacting with the podcast. Uh, we've only been doing it about a year now, but we absolutely love it. And um, it is it was really a bright light uh, during the pandemic when, you know, and I'm sure for you guys, too, you know, the first couple episodes we recorded with me in Chicago. Um, but we do it now over Zoom and it works out just fine. I'm doing it in my in my cluttered attic, just like this, uh, oh, just like yeah. today. And I, it can't works well. wait. I can't wait to in... do the pumpkin liqueur and the roast <laughs> pumpkin cassoulet. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really good. I mean, it, it's uh, so yeah, we always try to include a recipe, um, both a food and also a beverage. So Steve wrote a book a few years ago called um, uh, The New Old Bar. And he really is an expert in pre prohibition style uh, or era oh. cocktails. Uh, and it's a great book. And it's, um, it's available as an ebook. And it's also on Amazon. And then you mentioned my book eat like there's no tomorrow. It's actually sold out. So the one that you got on Amazon is probably oh. a used copy. Um, and I am, yeah. I am so far behind in doing a reprint of that. But honestly, I'm, I'm running a 1000 miles an hour, um, trying to squeeze as much life as I possibly can out of each day, which I know sounds like a cliche. Um, but the uh, it's on my to do list is a new new version and eventually a new cookbook as well. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, you you even had a blog on Amazon for a while, an author blog. Um, of course, it, it ran out after a while. But uh, I think it's more important than ever now that we're coming out of the pandemic, because a lot of people gained a lot of weight in the pandemic. And a lot of people got into bad habits during the pandemic. I did. I mean, the reason why I started going to the doctor was because I came out of the pandemic depressed, fat, and miserable. And I went to the doctor and he was like, yeah, you're depressed. And also you got these issues with your diet. You need to lose weight. You need to take care of your liver and your cholesterol. So that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying out some, some recipes from this book. And, um, for sure. I'm going to be following your But I Digest podcast. We'll add a link to it on the show yeah. notes. Thank yeah. you. And uh, we'll we'll put a, a few extra links here uh, so people can still find they, they can still find you on Twitter. Are you still on Twitter? I'm still that? on Twitter. Yeah, I'm uh, okay. still on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I hope I hope Twitter stays around. I was an early adopter. Yeah. I, I like Twitter. And I, um, you know, I've got pretty thick skin. I, I was raised by a cranky old sarcastic German man who loved to insult everybody um, in, in a fun way. He was like the Don Rickles, like a German Don Rickles, and then he insulted <laughs> everybody. Um, but anyway, I uh, and I can dish it out, too. So I don't mind that there's, you know, chaos and whatever. I, to me, that's just part of the it's sure. what you it's part of the freak show. It's what you go to see. Right. right. So um, but anyway, I um, I'm still on Twitter. My website is HansCooks.com. Um, podcast is But I Digest. And in the again, gastriccancer.org is where you'll find the Gesundheit Kitchen, which is also on YouTube. And, and as I mentioned before, it's for anybody that eats food. And I, and I specify that because there are some people who no longer eat food that, that have to take in food, uh, you know, either intravenously or through a feeding tube, which was me oh, yeah, multiple right, times. Right. Uh, but even if you have a feeding tube, there's good there are good products and there are bad products. There are mm -hmm. um, there are liquid foods for feeding tubes that are absolute crap, and there are some that are made out of actual foods with ingredients you can recognize. So um, even if you are on a feeding tube, you still are responsible for your nutrition. 
Um, maybe working with a dietitian or with a nutritionist, that's fine, but don't just sit back and wait for nutrition to happen to you. And I promise you, and this sounds like me being preachy, but I promise you, if you take control of that one thing, almost everything else falls into place. Uh, I started walking during the pandemic and I started walking for mental health because I was getting affected by that seasonal affective disorder where I was getting depressed as the days got shorter and, and right. it was getting dark earlier. And I just started having to walk, 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 walk. And so I was walking eight, 10, 12 miles a day uh, with no, not to go anywhere, but just to get my mind active. And so when I started walking, my, uh, the depression kind of slipped away. My muscle mass started building up. And of course I replaced walking with pickleball uh, or I, I augmented the two. I use both of them now, but um, again, just a little motivational thing. It is hard to be depressed if you stay active. And I'm not saying you've got to run a marathon or you've got to be competitive, just go walk. Um, if you can add that one thing to your physical regimen, just walk 30 minutes, an hour a day, and then watch what you eat. I promise you, everything else starts to fall into place. That sounds like great advice. I actually work from home, so I don't really get out of the house much, but I've got my little work workout nice. bike over there. Oh, so yeah, that kind of helps. Uh, yep, it's important. It is important. Yeah, it is important. It makes you feel better because that's what our bodies were made to do. And uh, yep. like I said, this whole pandemic threw a wrench into everything. And now that we're on our second year trying to get out of it, uh, last year, I called it the year of wellness. And this year, I'm calling it the year of minimalism. So I got to <laughs> work on minimalism because I, I'm not even going to show you how many books and tapes and movies are precariously like hanging off shelves. But uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Yeah. It, it's, it's been a pleasure not just to talk to you, but also to get to know your work a little better today. And uh, over this week, when I was looking at interviews and articles and your website, I'm looking forward to trying out some of your advice. And uh, you've gained a new subscriber. I just, I just like the page for But I Digest podcast oh, thank you. on Facebook, and I'll keep thank following you, you guys. And yeah, listen, but... I, I am so accessible personally. If anybody has a question, now I'm not a registered dietitian or a nutritionist. I am a chef, and I, but I answer people's questions all the time. And I'm not, there's no fee, there's no obligation, whatever. Uh, and if I don't know the answer, I will point you to somebody who does, or at least try to get you in the right direction. So um, I'm, again, I'm on Twitter at Hans, pretty much on Hans Cooks on anything. Uh, yeah. You can find me. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me, anybody, for anything. Wonderful. Thanks again right. for being with us. I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Hey, guys, keep up the great work. I, you know, obviously I love Clive personally. I love him as a fan, and I, I love that you guys are, are celebrating him on every episode. I think it's, a, it's an awesome thing that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Yeah, you too. Thanks. You too. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Thanks for listening.